moving to another section where you're about to see some near friendly fire. Here it is. Just then a Marine tank took to our rear. I'm sorry. Just then a Marine tank to our rear must mistook us for enemy troops. As soon as my hand went up to drop the round down the tube, a machine gun cut loose. It sounded like one of ours and from the rear of all places. As I peeped over the edge of the crater through the dust and smoke and saw a Sherman tank in the clearing behind us, the tank fired its 75 millimeter gun off to our right rear. The shell exploded nearby, around a bend in the same trail we were on. I then heard the report of a Japanese field gun located there as it returned fire on the tank. Again I tried to fire, but the machine gun opened up on us as before. A surge of panic rose within me. In a brief moment, our tank had reduced me to, from a well-trained, determined assistant mortar gunner to a quivering mass of terror. It was not just that I was being fired at by a machine gun that unnerved me so terribly, but that it was one of ours. To be killed by the enemy was bad enough. That was a real possibility I had prepared myself for. But to be killed by mistake, by my own comrades, was something I found hard to accept. It was just too much. And that is what we call a blue on blue. When friendlies shoot at friendlies and fratricide is what it's, what it's called when brother kills brother. And, you know, this is actually the opening of the book that Leif and I wrote, Extreme Ownership. The opening chapter is about this, this happening and happening under my command to my guys when I'm the senior guy. And that's why this idea that to be killed by mistake by my own comrades was something I found hard to accept. This is the, this is the mortal sin of combat. Mm. And sometimes when I talk about my deployment to Ramadi and what it was like for us, I, I say that basically every bad thing that could happen happened. Mm. And this is definitely one of them. Is, is being in a situation where there was friendly fire. And we were in a number of situations like this. None of them were as bad as, I, as the first one I talk about in the book. And here's how these guys get it solved. A volunteer crawled off to the left, and soon the tanks ceased firing on us. We learned later that our tankers were firing on us because we had moved too far ahead. They thought we were enemy support for the field gun. This also explained why the enemy shelling was passing over and exploding behind us. Tragically, the Marine who saved us by identifying us to the tanker was shot off the tank and killed by a sniper. Definitely one of the worst things in war. You think you have to worry about the enemy and things are so confusing. And there's such mayhem out there that you, you have to spend at least as much time, if not more, Deconflicting with your friendly troops as you do trying to figure out where the enemy is and kill them mm -hmm. And it's it's it was definitely a fast learning curve for us in Ramadi learning and understanding and deconflicting and wanting to be so Absolutely Certain of where everybody was and the term we would use and it is used in the military is frontline trace. Where are your guys? Where's the most forward that they are? And everybody needs to know that. In fact, and this might sound crazy. So we'd have, you know, people have in their minds of a, of a sniper position being, you know, two or three guys hidden yeah. very tactically and clandestine. In Ramadi, sometimes for our sniper overwatch positions, first of all, sometimes we have 20 or 30 guys in there mm. to secure a building so that the snipers and the machine gunners could work. But on top of that, in order to avoid there being a blue on blue, we had giant aircraft marking panels. So fluorescent orange 10 by 10 pieces of material that we would literally, the guys would literally hang them over the side of the overwatch positions to say, here we are, everyone. Don't shoot us. Oh, bad guys, you want to shoot us? Bring it and we'll yeah. kill you. 
But that's that's the extent that that we would go to to ensure that you weren't going to get shot by American forces. And there's you know Leif's got a, a a vignette in the book as well, a story about that almost happening. And and I tell another one that that blue on blue stuff was a nightmare. It was a nightmare to deal with. And you know. One thing I will say is we had that horrible one that resulted in, a, in an Iraqi soldier killed, a friendly Iraqi soldier killed very early on in our deployment. Mm. But we learned so much from it that we, we there was blue on blues that happened after that, but then we never had them get out of control like that first event. But again, for those people that have never been in combat before, and it was weird when Leif and I were writing the book, you know, we got done. I said, man, we've got three stories that are based on some sort of blue on blue happening. And, and we didn't plan it that way. But again, just to realize, you know, that's, that's how much we were thinking about it. That when we wrote about it, three of the stories were uh, just about, hey, preventing blue on blues, having a blue on blue, and then two of them are about preventing blue on blues. And if you've never been into combat, you, would th- you wouldn't think about that it's so confusing it's so confusing that there were situations in Ramadi where Humvees fired on other Humvees. So, so this is an American vehicle, and it's not like the, uh, the insurgents had Humvees. I mean, a Humvee is a very distinctive-looking vehicle, and there were situations where in the confusion and the mayhem and with you know, muzzle flashes, Humvees shot at other Humvees. That's how, that's how crazy and chaotic combat can get 